So I worked for Jim Brady um, in my last role, and uh, I've got to say, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. He has very odd tastes in sports teams and music. Um, but he's a very good boss, and he's a guy who was around um, at kind of the beginning of digital news, and he's been uh, involved in leadership kind of at every step of the way. Um, he was on the original Washington Post team, um, that uh, sports editor of the, their first kind of new media effort. He was on the team that helped wa launch WashingtonPost.com, eventually became executive editor of WashingtonPost.com, was at AOL. Um, and is behind some of the most talked about experiments in both local news, tbd.com in the DC area, and national news, Thunderdome, uh, in his role with uh, as executive editor, as editor in chief of uh, the country's second largest uh, newspaper company. And so now um, he has joined one of the, I guess this is probably unique amongst your past efforts. He has joined the ranks of independent publishers in that this is his own thing. Controlling his own fate with Billy Penn, uh, and he's going to talk to us about that. Great. I don't use a PC very much anymore, so how do I get this thing into actual <laughs> display mode, like full screen mode? Anybody know on a PC? Can you do that? Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Why right, anybody bottom. uses a PC is bottom, complete. Bottom right hand corner. Bottom. Yeah. I didn't say anything in there. So. F5. F5. F12. <laughs> F12. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's real. All right, we'll figure it out. Oh, wait, that's it. There you go. All right, I think they will. All right, will that do? All right, that'll do. Well, not, there we go. All right, so I'll make this real quick. I know we got, I am between you and beer. Um, and of course, I'm going to see, now I'm opening all sorts of crap up I don't even want. I'm going to have a code up. Um, so anyway. Um, Yes, yeah, so I'll walk you through this real quickly. Um, we are sort of cousins to uh, technically Philly because uh, our uh, uh, Brian's co-founder's uh, fiance is our community manager at Billy Penn, so we feel like we're in the same family uh, here. But so Billy Penn was born out of, out of uh, a simple idea of that. We're obviously, you know, you're, I have come out of big media, so I'm well aware, as you are, your time in Disney of the challenges of big media and decided after dealing with that for the better part of 20 years, I really wanted some time to just do something that was not attached to any larger organization, didn't come with any of the baggage that, that, that always comes with that. And so I'll talk a little bit about how we got where we are, but also more importantly, like the lessons about, I guess, well, the, the awesomeness of being small. Because a lot of times when you read people who work for small sites, they don't think it's awesome to be small. I talk a lot about why it sucks to be small. And I want to talk to you as someone who's had 20 years working at large companies, why it's actually pretty refreshing to be small in the hopes that it'll uh, resonate with some of you. So what it is, if you don't, those who don't know, is it launched October 22nd last year. It's based here, has a staff of six. The real concept behind it was there's a whole generation of younger news consumers who get their news by phone who are not being served by your traditional legacy organizations. Um, we're still focused, if they're not focused on print, they're certainly focused on desktop. They're not really focused on mobile yet. And so we designed it to look better on mobile. We, the, we make it, a, the user interface is very simple. You'll never see a pop-up ad that keeps you from reading anything on mobile. You don't want to see it on the desktop either. But it's very easy to scan through and use. It's focused at 35 and under generation, um, who likes their news with a little bit more voice and a little bit more how-to and a little bit more of a connection to their day-to-day -day life. Um, Maybe extremely importantly, it's a one-stop curation shop for Philly news consumers. And this is, to me, like one of the great failures of legacy media is this unwillingness to largely embrace curation, which, you know, uh, is a complete mystery to me. Because people say, like, well, why would I do that? Yeah, because there's hardly any companies that have built a business on linking out to other people, you know, like Google or Facebook or Twitter or, or sites like that. Obviously, they have a function of their own, but they are passed through usually to other sites, but they've done just fine with that idea. And we want to be a place people come to when they want to know what's going on in Philadelphia and don't much care who reported the news. They just want to go someplace and get it all on one stream to save them time. Because no matter how good technology gets and Moore's Law and the speed of processing, like we're still going to have 24 hours in a day and 60 minutes in an hour, right? Because some things are never going to change. And if I can save you time by having you come to Philly Penn scan for 30 seconds and feel like you're caught up, I'm fine with that. I don't need you to spend 30 minutes on my side. I want you to be come, have a good experience, and go. The big, the big thing that we're focused on as 
technically is, is we really want to make events the priority, the, the primary revenue stream for us because I am a believer that the CPM ad model for local is just not going to work. In the end, it's just not possible to make enough money off display advertising, pure. Maybe off classifieds you can get some and maybe off of selling other services, but the pure, just selling a bunch of ads against your traffic, I think is a model that can't work unless you're very unique because you don't have much control over the CPMs if you're working with networks. Those CPMs could drop a buck or two or three bucks, you know, without much, without you really doing anything wrong. All of a sudden, you're making less money on the same page views. And so now you're thinking, all right, my CPM's way down. I've got to generate twice as many page views just to make the same amount of money I was making last month. And that leads you to do things like, you know, pop-up ads or photo galleries or taking a five-inch story and paginating it into four pages and you know, doing all these things to make your page views better which eventually will piss off everybody who comes to your site. So choose your poison. I'm going to gin up page views to make more money to piss off my readers, or I'm going to treat my readers like they're the king, and I'm going to give them a good experience. If you choose the latter, you have to have another revenue source in addition to ads, and that's why we're doing events. And we've now done about three major events, about 15 total. And what we're finding is that advertisers really like the idea of an experience because millennials, if you look at the research, are very clear about the fact they value experiences over possessions. Like they all this research about their mindset is they love, they want experiences. And so we're, what we're selling to advertisers is the ability to access a lot of millennials in Philadelphia for a message that's specific to them. And we, are, we just made our largest sale yesterday. We haven't signed the IO isn't signed yet, I guess, but it's for 6,500 bucks. And basically it's half advertising and half an event. And that's how we're trying to go out and sell, which is to say we gotta sell something other than the page views because if I'm selling page views, I'm going to have to figure out how to make more of them to make more inventory, and I don't want to be that guy. So, um, so I won't. You know, this is just the. I just I won't go through all this, but the fact that it took me, it's really hard to get the problems with local media and legacy media on one slide. Like, it's <laughs> um, I mean, just I mean, if you don't know this already, it's useful to know. 55% decline in ad revenue for newspapers, but maybe more importantly, a 52% drop in their in their share of digital revenue in the last decade. So they're not only losing money altogether, they're losing their share in the digital space, which is a good opportunity for us that we can figure out how to do with something different than they're doing. It's not much of their pie. And I think any of us who've worked in these big places know that this may be the truest line of the whole thing. If you're working in a newspaper, the debt, the pension liability, unions, culture are actually more in the way of change than almost any of those other things. They're just not that interested in significant change. So TV viewership is down, but the revenue has actually been pretty flat thanks to election, local elections and, and Citizens United. A lot of things have actually kept money flowing into their coffers, so they're not quite as driven to change as newspapers are. And radio, it's 4% of their overall revenue is digital, so they don't, there's just not a whole lot of push right there for them to move to digital as fast as newspapers. So to me, the landscape's wide open for somebody to come in and, and you know, to sum up, they're just not structured or oriented to serve the local news consumer of the future, in my opinion. So some may disagree and some have when I put that slide up at another conference, I was like booing, but hey. It's not like I, not like I didn't work there, for, work in them for 20 years. It's not like I don't have some experience in that. Why millennials, for those who don't know, biggest boomer, it's the biggest uh, demo in the country now. But I think maybe most importantly to me is that they consume media so differently than people over the age of like 40, 45, that the idea that you're gonna have a strategy that's gonna appeal to a 25-year-old college student and 55-year-old print reader out of the same newsroom, it's just no shot. They're just so different. The devices are different, the format's different, the tone is different, the consumer's relationship with news is different. This one really, you know, and 34.5% of 18 to 24 say they get their, their news from online-only news sites. Not the websites of traditional news media, but of actually from online-only news sites, which to me is just a sign of where those readers are going to be and why we have an opportunity to get them. Why mobile is now more mobile traffic than desktop traffic. I think the last bullet here is the one that's, or the second to last one's the most interesting. That 93% of millennials think that the smartphones are on the list of the most important things to own, which is 2% more than toothbrushes and 6% more than deodorant. So, uh, at least if you run into a really uh, yellow tooth stinky millennial, they probably still have a phone. So, um, and Lastly, this last bullet was this, which is actually Q3 2014, time spent on mobile devices surpassed television, which was always viewed as like the untouchable. You can't get people spending more time doing anything than watching television. And look how far that came in just two years, 10 quarters. Went from 109 to 177, while TV stayed flat, literally. So 
So that's why we're doing it. And for those, a lot of people ask why Philadelphia. It doesn't seem like the most millennial city, but it's had one of the biggest growths uh, of millennials in percentage basis, 20, 20, up to 26 percent now from 20 percent five years ago. Ranks third in the U.S. in percentage of young city dwellers uh, behind D.C. and Baltimore. Um, and so they just made it for, made a very good opportunity to come. And there's really no that's falling falling sucks. No other site in Philly focused solely on young demographic surroundings. Um, and then uh, so that is that. So the, the bigger part of it is just how to be David, right? So I've been the guy with the shield and the big thing before, and uh, and that's why I always laugh when people say, oh, it must be so great to be in one of those places with so many resources, and you just laugh because you're like, yeah. David dies. I mean, Goliath dies, if you remember, or he doesn't win this battle. So why is that? And I think to me, like, this is the real takeaway, which is you got. You can't focus on the disadvantages of being small. You have to focus on the advantages of it, because there are a lot of them. And I'll walk through some of them in a second. And I think you should focus on how big your competitors are, but only on the limitations that come with that. I think it's like it's an old, tired metaphor, maybe, of the ocean liner and the speedboat. But you know, ocean liners come with a lot of advantages. But the, the Titanic was an ocean liner as well, and there are plenty of speedboats that are, uh, you know, that have advantages that those liners never have. So focus on the positive, not the negative. And I want to give an example of it. Is like this is what I always hear: why being small sucks. Not enough staff, no infrastructure. You can't cover everything. There's less history to build on, less brand recognition, hard to grow revenue. You have to develop a voice, and you know, we're just too small to succeed. So, or I would say by being small rocks. Not too much staff, because that's every newspaper in the country has too much staff right now. They, they can't support what they have, and they're just going to keep trimming for the next five years. And that sucks the soul out of an organization when you have to keep cutting and cutting and cutting. You have less overheads. You don't have as much stuff, but you're not paying for as much stuff either. That's good. You can cover anything. You, know, it's, uh, you don't have to cover everything if you're the size of the people in this room. You just pick what you want to cover. You don't have to be comprehensive. Well, and I, well I'll be my argument that you don't have to be. Others may argue. But I feel like with staff, the staff size is the most of the people in this room. You can't be everything, so why don't you just use your people against anything you want? You have less history to overcome in a lot of ways. A lot of big news organizations and cities are not really beloved by their audience, especially not really beloved by advertisers either, who've been paying really crazy rates for the last 20, 30 years that they would mind spending their money with somebody else. You have complete ability to define the brand, which I think is a great opportunity. Yeah, you don't have a huge amount of revenue, but at least you're not facing the implosion of your existing revenue, which, like the staff, is the thing that just beats down on these papers every single day. There's no limitations on your voice. You can make your voice whatever you want it to be, and you don't have to stay within the strict confines of what your traditional journalism, journalism voice is. And you're not big enough to fail. You might be too small to succeed in your mind, but you're certainly not so big that you're going to have this cataclysmic collapses that you're seeing around the industry right now. So to me, it's, much, it's a better thing. It's a good thing, not a bad thing. So this, Quickly, and then I will get to drinks and questions if there are any. But there's like seven quick tactics that I that we that we've used for Billy Penn. This is not specific to everybody in the room. This is the stuff we talk about internally. It is do not chase the stories everybody else is chasing. In a city of this size, if there's a huge, you know, let's put Amtrak aside for a second, and I'll get to that. Your average day-to-day -day chaos in any major metropolitan city, or a traffic accident on 76, or a lot of those smaller things that go on on a day-to-day -day basis in the city like this will be covered aggressively by local television and will be covered aggressively by the Inquirer, the Daily News, and other people in town. We never are the 51st person at a press conference or the sixth person at a press conference. We don't want to be standing with five other reporters in Philadelphia because someplace there's no reporter. And we would rather go there and get a story that nobody else is doing. So I think for us, it's the, the freedom of not having to be comprehensive is maybe our greatest freedom. We just don't have to do anything that we don't think fits what we're trying to do. Tactic two is like use curation to provide that comprehensiveness. We have more people who think that, we asked a couple of our friends that were drinks once, like uh, how many people they thought we had, I'm not friends, but readers, but how many people they thought we had on staff, and they said 15 to 20. And that's because in their mind, they go to Billy Penn, they find something on the Inquirer, they find something on Philly Mag, and they find the original stuff we're doing. We're doing four to six original pieces a day. Um, but they just go there, and they get a pretty complete read on what's going on in the city through the eyes of a 35 and under audience we're trying to hit. And in their mind, that makes us feel really big. And I'd ask if you're not doing much curation in your city at this point, or your site at this point, like, why aren't you doing it? Because usually the only people who aren't doing it are the ones who think they have something to lose by not doing it. Um, well, why would I let anybody know there's another site in this town? I'm the king of the town, of course. The younger news consumers are probably, well, all news consumers, really, all know that there are other sites in town. Not linking to them and acting like they don't exist is, is pretty stupid. And eventually it will cost you when somebody comes in and undercuts you and does it well. 
And so for us, this is where Amtrak kicked in. We tweeted actually more, it's on the next slide, we actually tweeted out, I think, the most of anybody in the 12 hours after that in Philadelphia about Amtrak specifically, more than the Inquirer, more than the Daily News, more than the TV stations. And we were just looking for developments reported by anybody, including ourselves. And we just, we went kind of bananas on that for four days, and we got a lot of nice tweets like this, which are, I think I've read more articles linked to by Billy Penn in the last month than any other single source. Now, he gets that he's being curated, and that the curation is what he's reading, but I don't sense that he's upset about that. I don't think he views of what we were, any problem with that. And I should say, by the way, we are believers in straight out curation. Paul knows this, but we like, we blink straight out. We don't like rewrite your story in three graphs and give a link at the bottom so we can steal some page views along the way because I don't have a big enough staff to do that even if I thought it was right, and I don't. And then we got a nice call out from Brian Stelter, who's, you know, it was always nice to get a call out from Stelter, has about eight billion followers, but he listed us first as a local source to follow on the Amtrak thing, and I think that, from that point on, our traffic has been at a different level because we got a lot of people who found us who did not know we were there before. So tactic three, and again, this is don't get too tied to the routine stories, but more importantly, maybe the second one is like, think about the long tail of every story that you write. Like how long do these stories have where they will be valuable to the people reading them? That's partially why I don't want to cover fires. Beyond the fact they're covered by a lot of people, a fire that goes out in which there's no, nobody's injured, that, that, that story is not interesting to anybody the minute the last, you know, the last flame goes out. And a traffic accident that there's no fatalities on is pretty much the story's over by the time they clear the road. So uh, we want to write stories that have shelf life. So when we covered the election, we wrote a lot of stories about, you know, what is the sort of arc of mer medic med medicinal marijuana policy in Philadelphia and uh, Pennsylvania. We write stories about, we wrote a great story on the um, procra uh, procrastinator's guide to the mayoral primary, where we listed every position of every mayoral candidate and all of the issues that we thought were most important to. Millennials, we go out and we write stories about, we do the, a lot of 101 stories and we try to explain an issue that has popped back up on the news after a couple of years for people who are new to the city might not understand like why Shaka Fatah is, you know, uh, potentially going to be indicted and so they want to get a little background on that. So we try to look at every story and I even track every day in our metrics what percentage of our traffic comes from stories that we wrote before today. And a lot of days it's 50, 55 percent and that's a good healthy number so that you're not always you don't always need today's stories to keep your traffic up. You've got like a base of traffic from stories you wrote a month ago, a week ago, in some cases even four or five months ago. And for us, that's a way to sort of make the staff seem bigger. It seems like, it seems like I must have read 15 stories Anna Orso wrote today, who's one of our reporters. Like, how busy do you keep her? And like, I bet you if you went back and looked at those stories, they were from six different days. Like, they weren't all written today. They were written over the last couple of months. So, and, then, and a couple of things we do on this front are who's next, which is where we profile young up-and-comers in different uh, categories around the city. And these things are great because they're, they're sort of very shareable. And the joke I always make is four days after we launched, I think we did who's next in politics, and we had people on Facebook going, oh my god, I just got named to the who's next list by a site I've never heard of before, <laughs> literally. The site like was four days old. I mean, people could not have known who we were, but they were still putting on Facebook that I made this list. And so every month we do one of these in a different category and it helps us get the word out and helps us share uh, and all that. And this is the example of things that continue to get traffic every single day, no matter what. And all of these who's next to do really well. And the same thing, we profile a neighborhood in Philadelphia every week. We talk about literally where its boundaries are, what's the history of that neighborhood, what are the demographics of it, you know, even some good pop culture references if the movie's been shot there or some history has happened there. And again, we make these awesome looking postcards, each like old style postcards every week for each neighborhood. I actually sell those in our store. Um, if you're looking for another way to make a little money is find something cool to design and actually sell it on Cafe Press, which we do. And the goal here is to eventually kind of have a map where the whole city is mapped out and you can click on any of these things and read up about that neighborhood. Again, another thing that's good long tail in the sense that the neighborhoods aren't going to change so fast that those are going to go out of date. Tactic four, but when a huge story happens in your backyard, own it. And I think that's when the Amtrak thing happened, that was one of those ones where we just say, you know what, this one is worth throwing everything at. Uh, because this story was a national story, it was a huge story locally. I, I, I credit this to brilliant management on my part, but our product manager was on the train, so I, you know, it's so, it, you know, it was just like she happened to be going back to New York after spending a day down here. And she was on the first car behind the, cap, uh, the uh, 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 quiet car, so she got tossed about 70 miles an hour. And of course, as a former journalist, uh, she immediately started telling us what was going on and sending us photos. So we got a, certainly got an early start on knowing about that story. 
but I think after that, we really did well at, on the curation piece of it and finding angles that were different than others. And this is that graph I was talking about before, where we produced about 12 original pieces on Amtrak and the three days after curated 61 more. And then we just continued to tweet out live tweet press conferences. And we actually went back and checked and CBS3 tied us. They pulled into a tie at the end of this. But for the most part, we were kind of leading the pack in terms of who was actually tweeting the most. And obviously, the two TV stations behind us both did pretty well. But considering the size of the staffs of everybody on that list, I would say like, you know, our ability to stay at the top or tied at the top of that list was pretty impressive. And I think that we said rest sense that was a real opportunity. And then five is partner with anyone and everyone anyone and everyone to get exposure. Um, we partnered with Fox twenty nine in Philadelphia to do this ultimate Philly athlete bracket where we just, you know, it's such an easy, fun simple thing to do, pick 32 famous Philly athletes and then just have the readers vote every day on which one was the better, greater athlete in Philadelphia. You get, you get a month out of it, you just do a vote kind of every week, you do another round and we ended up on Fox 29 a lot, just like uh, promoting this and getting that logo sitting up in the middle of their broadcast every morning, which was a nice piece of branding for us. And we got no money out of it. People said, why didn't they pay you for that? It's like, because they're Fox 29, we're Billy Penn and we're a warm up. At that time, we were two months old and they were Fox 29. So going and asking them for money at that point would have been folly. So you just go there and you take the exposure. And uh, we continue, we're going to do another one of these with them on another subject uh, next month. Uh, we have a Comcast Every Block sponsorship where we, we have these neighborhood pages where you can see what crimes have been reported in different neighborhoods in Philly, updated every morning. And you can actually follow your neighborhood. So if you live in Fairmount and you want to get an automatic email every morning talking about what crimes and what 311 data was called, then you can actually sign up for that and get an update every day. So tactic six, don't be, don't be afraid to do crazy stuff. I think uh, I made this reference before, don't you stay weird, which is if you're the new guy in town, you gotta do whatever you can do to get noticed, you know, obviously through the journalistic boundaries, but, but I think, uh, you know, don't be afraid of, you know, even if it might, even if occasionally they blow up in your face and you get a little bad press. I mean, if you're, if you're just starting out and you're trying to figure out how to find your way, you know what, is, there is a little bad press isn't the worst thing in the world as long as you don't do something that you literally can't recover from. And most mistakes we make are things we can't recover from. And an example of that for us was like, let's do something really fun. We do a weekly news playlist every week where we recap the week in Philadelphia news and put a song to like six different stories and then make the playlist downloadable on Spotify. So if you just want to discover some music while educating yourself on what happened in the city last week, um, you can do that. So, um, you know, it's, you know, so it's, it, that's been really popular for us. We do it every Friday now, and you know, and that one's been good. This other one we did, which we got a little poo-pooed on from some people, is for the mayoral race. We decided to make emojis of each of the, mayor, the six major mayoral candidates, and uh, we got a little bit of grief from some people saying, like, ah, that doesn't seem serious, you know. It's like, why would you do that? It kind of makes it look like you know, you're, you're trying to trying to you're trying to reach four-year-olds. And it's like, well, I don't know. I mean, they, they, they ended up being pretty popular because here's the mayor of Philadelphia with his signed emoji. They <laughs> went to Michael Nutter. He liked it enough that he signed it and took one home. And this is Jim Kenney, our next, uh, likely our next mayor. I mean, technically there's an election, but the Democratic primary in Philadelphia is pretty much the election. And what I loved about this is this was him sending out a tweet saying, hey, I'm here to answer your questions on Twitter. He was doing a Twitter chat. And he put this picture up, this, like, we, this was totally accidental that that was sitting there, but the emoji we did for him is sitting on his desk, right, as he's ready to do this, right, you know, ready to do his chat. So we love the fact that they were popular enough that he decided apparently to get his framed. So we were pretty key. But the bottom line is we got known for a lot, but now the candidates know who we are. They all came in and signed their emoji. We had an opportunity to get to meet them. And when you're a really new site in town, it's hard to get known. And for us, like doing the crazy stuff, you know, we did something not too long ago, which is, which is, it, which of the, if the, all the mayoral candidates had been in the wire, which character would they have been? You know, and it's just like goofy <laughs> stuff like that. And people say like, oh, this stuff seems kind of silly. You know what though? But that got a lot of traffic and people liked it. And the bottom line is you can't be afraid to try to have some fun and do something really goofy. And occasionally, maybe you do something that's a little too goofy, but I think it's a lot easier you to recover. that again, what you just said? The wire, which yeah. is like if the, yeah, if, the, if the mayoral candidates had each been on the wire, which character were they closest okay. to? Okay. And one of the mayoral candidates actually responded by saying he was Manny was a Marlowe, which was interesting because <laughs> Marlowe was kind of a bad, or called a pretty bad guy in that show. Who claimed Marlowe? What's that? Who claimed Marlowe? I think it was, uh, I think it was Tony Williams, I think. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I think he said that was the response. It was like, I want to be Marlowe or something like that. But again, you get a response from a candidate about it. And, 
So you know, it's better to be better to be weird and have to say, yeah, maybe that was a little too much, than to like not do anything to get you noticed. That's my attitude, and I know that's a some counter to how some think about this business we're in. So that, that, that sounds very but Buzzfeedish. Yeah, right. I, I make no apologies for that. Buzzfeed is. Back when I was at Digital First Media, when I would ask people what they think of BuzzFeed, there were, I always thought there were two acceptable answers. One was, I love it, I, I don't know why, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed that I love it, but I love it, or I hate it, but there's a lot to learn from it. And that, either of those answers were fine, but I hated when people said it's stupid, it's stupid and it's ridiculous. It's like, you know what, if you can't really learn anything from what BuzzFeed is doing, then I don't know what to say, because they've learned a lot about how to get audience. and. And, you know, and everybody says, well, I do all these cat videos. They also have a lot of investigative reporters now, a lot of good reporters now. And yeah, the cat videos pay for the investigative reporting the same way auto dealers and banks pay for most newspapers reporting. So I'm not sure what the what the big deal is there. I mean, it's always paid for by something else. And, and they totally figured out how to get the millennials excited. Yeah. And so we do a lot of those things. We did a Game of Thrones Philadelphia thing, like profiling some of the big political families in Philly. And that's fine. I don't, I mean, we definitely get beat on a little bit for it for sometimes not being serious enough, but as I said, that's the least of my concerns. And of, of like, we do a lot of serious stuff, but the, you know, people are not, they don't wake up every day saying, I really want to be serious for the next 18 hours. They want to do some serious things, they want to have some fun. Everybody's life's a little more integrated than like, I wake up every day wanting to, to read really, to be really impactful things. You know, after you read a lot of impactful stories, those same people want to go out and read something goofy or go out and have a drink. and. Got to stop treating like news consumers like they just want to consume serious, sober content all day. Nobody does. Um, I mean, I think the last is stop listening to people who tell you what you local can't do because I've heard this a lot. It's like, why would you do local? Why wouldn't you try to do something more national? And it's like, well, you know, because local doesn't scale. Local doesn't do this. You can't do this with local. But what we can do with local is get our audience all in one physically in one city, which is what we have here, which is where we built this events business. So. You know, we've had these are the three big events we've had. We had a launch party where we honored the first three groups of Who's Next that we did. 280 people at the Union Trust that was sponsored by Visit Philadelphia and the Knight Foundation locally here. Um, we did an event at the top of the Comcast Center, sponsored by Comcast, which was how to keep technology town in Philadelphia. Um, we did something at our office at Pipeline, which is the Pew, uh, Pew Charitable Trust, talking about the State of Philadelphia report they do every year. And so we've been able, and we've had, we had an election night party. We've had about 15 kind of happy hours like things where we just invite readers to come out and we give them a free beer if they show us that they've signed up for the newsletter on the phone or they're a Twitter follower or like that to show us something that says you're a Billy Penn, you're involved with us somehow. And if you haven't at that point, you can certainly sign up for the newsletter standing there and we'll hand you a drink ticket. Works. Bribery? Absolutely. <laughs> do that. That's okay. They're, if they want to come get a free beer, they got to give us something. Do you pay the bars for that, or do the bars get free advertising, or like? No, we pay the bars for. It. We do it for like the first fifty, so it keeps the cost down. If we have, a, if for some reason, five hundred people show up, we're not paying for five hundred first beers. It's like the first fifty. That we <laughs> so we we cap it a little bit. And if you do it during happy hour, you get like happy hour pricing, and you can do fifty beers for like hundred bucks a lot of the time, and you get sixty, seventy people to show up. It's a really good deal. So that's. So to me, that's the huge advantage of local. You have a generation that wants that wants to have experiences. They like to go out to events. And the good news is your audience is all physically, or most of it, obviously, is not all here, but it's about 75% Philadelphia DNA. You've got them in, in an area where you can get them together and, and have some fun or educate or do whatever it is that's required. So, so that's the short, um, maybe not as short as you'd hope, since there's beer waiting. but. Uh, that's, that's Billy Penn, so do we have time for questions? Yeah, or we have a, a, okay. time for a few. I don't want to uh, keep people no, I don't away from the beer for too, too, too long, but well, and certainly <laughs> you know, we, want, we want the conversation to uh, continue over the yeah. but uh, while we're all here in one room, if we can make a few questions that are uh, the most compelling ones you can come up with so that everybody can hear. So I hope to pick your brain for my project, so I hope this mild criticism Mm -hmm. uh, by Firewatch and Carl. Yeah. So um, I'm 45, I'm not a millennial. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, I'm an intense local political junkie, mm -hmm. like not just Philly, you yeah. know, Chicago. So I'm probably different than what the target audience are looking for once. But to me, what you guys do best, I mean, most, the thing that will probably get most traction in local stuff mm -hmm. might be like the light artist stuff, mm -hmm. you guys did the, to be the best coverage of the, of the elections yeah. of anybody. Mm -hmm. And that includes the next mayor, this is all really hyper funny stuff, um, and other <laughs> publications. Are you worried that you're trying to criticism? 
<laughs> no, no, that was the flat earth. Oh, say. Uh, <laughs> you should say what's coming. So, are you worried that your target audience might impact what I think you do best, what I imagine your editorial team might like mm -hmm. doing best, like civic stuff? Yeah. You are? No, we're going to keep doing civic stuff. I mean, that's the thing you do in politics, and I'm sorry, I might be misunderstanding your question. So you also do uh, list type stuff, not the these are the best people with this or the other, right, right. like um, the pretzels or whatever. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Like, like and I'm saying stuff. to me that when I see that stuff, I go through that and I try to read politics. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying, are you worried that that kind of stuff seems to might have maybe have more traction with millennials because millennials don't, younger people don't tend to be into politics and civic engagement as much. I, ours are though. I mean, I would say if we listen. Yours to, are. Yeah, I would say if we listen to the top ten stories we've ever done for them with the politics. I mean, the, 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 um, the, the guy that I was talking about, the procrastinators guy for the election, did really well. Um, we did one on the candidate's position on, I think it was uh, ride sharing, which did, you know, because that's a big issue with younger consumers. And we've had great success with And obviously, some of the just stuff like the Game of Thrones stuff. I mean, the thing about the Game of Thrones and the Wire thing is that they all are actually meant to educate you about the candidates, because then you have to explain why this candidate would be the closest to this. And on the way, you've actually communicated some information about the candidate. So those things are not totally frivolous. They're sort of an interesting way to get people into the story, but then you, you, you actually give them information that's valuable. But no, I think they're very interested in political stuff. I mean, the most popular story we've ever done was a campus crime, like taking all the campus crime data in Philadelphia and kind of ranking the campuses on different types of crime that, you know, I mean, and that's not exactly fun and exciting, but it's something that every college student in town dug into. So I always think the things about um, politics and civic have been among the most popular. I'm not going to stop doing that. I mean, you'll always see an interesting mix. The thing I've always told Chris Crusoe, who's our editor, is that even I, as the guy who's, who goes to this every day, you know, I pretty much know half of what the newsroom's going to do, but the other half I don't because I'm out trying to raise money and do fun stuff like that. But man, I'm always surprised. Just when I think we've like maybe done one thing too many times, I feel like it's starting to be a little like I can predict the next thing that comes and do something totally different. So I, I know that's the goal is to keep you surprised. Back on this question, mm -hmm. what do you use to manage or measure your progress, success? Uh, Google Analytics and Parsley, you know, both of those. And I should say, based on Brian's conversation, I probably should give details on this. We're on WordPress, all our newsroom communication is through Slack. Uh, we have a newsletter that's got about 1,850 subscribers, that's all MailChimp. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think what other kind of tools we use. But for us, Slack has been maybe the greatest, you know, the, Greatest learning for me. I was not. I didn't. I hadn't used Slack before uh, much. I use a little bit of BFM, but it's been great for us because I mean everything sits in there and can be searched for months at a time. So, but yeah, we uh, Parsley and Google Analytics are the core analytics tools that we use. I just went back there first. Uh, yeah, Jim, could you expand on uh, what you think the shortcomings of the CPM model are for uh, a local news I, I think I. I think the problem is, is like it's a sort of yeah, you have to choose your poison. I'm either going to do everything I can. To, now, if you can, if you can organically drive real page views, like to a point where you can be profitable, then you don't have a problem. I think the problem is that pricing can change. Sort of, if you're if you're using ad networks, that mo that model can change without you doing anything because the market can get flooded. Or so you're kind of, to me, like basing it totally on that means a lot of the control of your business model is sort of not in your hands. If you're using networks. So if you're selling your own ads and you can be profitable on that, then like I said, I don't think you have a problem. My position is, is that if I have a $2 CPM and I'm making enough, just enough money to be profitable and all of a sudden my effective CPM drops down to 150 or one, now I've either got to like double the number of impressions, which means I have to load up the site with a bunch of crap ads, or I have to figure out a way to double my page views, which means all those tactics I talked about before. And I feel like you kind of get in a position where I'm making the money, but my readers hate me or my readers love me and I don't have enough revenue. So if you have another revenue source that you can tap into, you're not totally beholden to the ad model. And that's what I didn't want from doing this, was to have all, all of the eggs in that basket, because it is, you don't even really own the basket completely. And so, so you are selling your ads? Right? Yeah, we have native ads in the stream through Nativo. We, we have a DFP, so we, we, we work with a couple of networks. But we don't have a ton of ads. I mean, we've made more on native than we had on have on, on network display. We obviously still sold, sold some of our own campaigns, which is great. But we really focused on, the, in the stream at least, on doing native in there, and a couple of display ads, but no pop-ups, no pop-unders, no autoplay video. We're just trying to make it like, this is a site you can come to and know that you're going to be able to get in get out and have a good experience. And as long as we can engender that loyalty then, and have a different 
revenue stream to tap into. I feel like that that is a bulwark of some kind. Hi, Jim. Hey. Uh, congratulations on the ad event field. Um, yeah. Can you say a little more about on the event side what the advertiser is getting? Yeah, you know, what the advertiser is getting is essentially us putting it together. Uh, an event in which they'll get to get up and say something and it'll be promoted as sort of a Billy Penn event with a sponsor and the sponsor will get an opportunity to get up there and talk a little bit and, and then we're kind of jointly coming up with how we work out the theme. They have a theme they want to go after and we're trying to figure out the logistics around the theme. So our ad person that we hired is also our events person. So she's, just, she's worked with both in her career. So she's basically sold them the package and now she's working with them on kind of what is the theme they're trying to go after. And then all they're going to have to do is show up somewhere for an hour and get some free food and listen to a pitch for a little while from an advertiser and then the rest will run on the site. But everybody we pitched on this idea that, you know, and I'm not going to lie, I mean, because we have the strategy we have with page views, like, I could probably be at four times the page views I'm at if I just wanted to do all of those things I don't want to do. But we kept the site really clean, but, and by not doing those things, we're pushing it about, right now, you know, seven months in, about 150, 160K a month. Um, and so even if I sold out every impression on the site for a month, like if I sold four or five big ad deals, I'm out of rep, I'm out of inventory. So for us, having the event is a way to say like, it's a way to make more money without having to sell inventory that you don't have. So in this case, we go in and we say, we have a package for you that's gonna be a combination of advertising and we can do, we actually pitched two and three smaller events this particular advertiser and they came back and said, let's just do one big one. And it's like right smack dab in the middle of the city and it's, it'll be something that people just out for lunch will be able to pop into and when we've got the facility locked down and we've got that locked down yesterday so i can't say the advertisements yet because i don't want that on, uh, on twitter yet since uh they haven't signed it officially but uh, but but that's basically how we're going in and pitching it saying we have a you know and everybody chips in and do the events the newsroom helps figure out the program but we have an editorial program for the event they work it out chris our editor is usually the moderator if it's an editorial panel so we just make it up as we go. That's worked so far. I think we've got time for one more question. And I have a question about Twitter. Yes. You know, um, in terms of return on investment, mm -hmm. you know, for time spent on Twitter. Talk a little bit about Twenty percent of our traffic comes from Twitter. Not twenty percent of our social, but twenty percent of our traffic. I don't see that coming. I mean, yeah. I have a pretty active Twitter feed. Um, we have about thirty-three hundred followers. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, our conversion is like you know, it's it's just nothing. What we do get a shit ton of traffic mm -hmm. is from Facebook. Yeah, I mean, you we know. get about twenty percent from we get uh, twenty percent of our total traffic from Twitter, eighteen percent from Facebook. But the difference is, is that for us, Twitter is like a heartbeat. Every day, it's pretty consistent. Yeah. Facebook's a heart attack. It's like oh, all the way up, all the way down, yeah. all the way up, all the way down. Mm -hmm. So some days something takes, and we get four thousand page views from Facebook, and the next day we get four hundred. Twitter is like kind of a steady everyday thing for us. I mean, we have about 5,800 followers. We're very aggressive on it. We're, you know, I, I, I can't speak to the return, the return of your case, but we are a lot of voice and we retweet a lot of other people's stuff. So we even do the, we take the curation into Twitter. Um, so it's been a huge, a huge driver for us. And the way we structure it, it might be time spent too. Because we have four staffers, four newsroom, an editor, community manager, two reporters and everybody does three hours of curation a day. So literally for 12 hours a day, somebody is like tasked with keeping the Facebook and the Twitter feeds going and looking at what else is being reported in the community. It's not, hey, if anybody happens to see anything in their spare time, throw it up. It's like you're responsible for the feeds during those three hours you're on shift. So it's that level of attention that we've set, which probably would probably help. And I think it depends a lot on your community. So some towns are Twitter towns and others are you know, way yeah. more Facebook and we're in them. In Tucson, it's much more on, on Facebook, yeah. and you know, Twitter is not uh, really a, a big. Yeah, Matt, Matt can media. speak to that too from the time of DFM. We had some papers where the Twitter following was, been, was crazy, and others with the, the, the Facebook. And it was like cities that were 10 miles apart yeah. would be totally different in terms of who use which platform. So I just got to figure that out. Thank you. Sure. Very, very Before we go, have a, a, a little bit of food and a, a couple of beers. Uh, remember to come back at uh, 9 a.m. sharp so we don't uh, slip too far behind schedule tomorrow because it's going to be a, a very packed day with a whole lot of panels and uh, a whole lot of uh, all of us uh, you know, sh sharing more of what we've learned and uh, asking questions about what we still need to figure out. And um, you know, with that, thank you all very much for uh, coming and uh, sharing so much. Thank you. Thank you.
right down the hall.